So in the next few minutes, I'm going to uh, cover, I think, one of the most important topics in, in prostate, prostate cancer, and that's the impact of biomarkers and all this controversy about early detection of prostate cancer. I bring you greetings from Colorado, which is uh, pretty close to here, as you well know. <laughs> this is the Aspen Valley, and the Aspen's changing. There is a Crawford County that is in Colorado, and there I am with my picture. And Rocky Mountain High has a new meaning from when I grew up in John Denver. Um, and uh, it uh, has had a major impact on our state. Anyway, my disclosures are here. And a number of the companies that I consult for or speak are going to be covered in this uh, presentation, their products. So let's go with the ARS question number one. This is a urine-based test to detect aggressive cases of prostate cancer. <coughs> what is it? PCA3, 4K score, select MDX, or PHI, prostate health index. And let's see what uh, people said. OK. Let's see if that changes. Next one. What percent of men have a PSA of less than 1.5 in a screening population? In other words, if you went out and picked up 50,000 PSAs that were run in your lab or whatever, 500,000, what percent are uh, less than 1.5? A, 50, less than 50 percent, two, less than 34 percent, three, greater than 70 percent, or four, greater than 80 percent. All right, let's see what everybody said. Okay, We've got, we're going to have some fun with this talk. All right, let me get started. I think there are uh, several important needs in prostate cancer, and one is that early detection, the controversies about that. We need to start with primary care physicians. They need a simple message, and we're going to focus on that in a minute. Second is in early detection of prostate cancer, we need to focus on men who have significant cancers that would benefit from treatment. So we really think the need to think beyond PSA. PSA screening or early detection, as I like to call it, has poor specificity. There are too many negative prostate biopsies that are done in the United States each year. We'll talk about that. We are plagued with over-detection and treatment of insignificant disease. We have these false negative biopsies. Um, we have really incorrect risk stratification and sort of over-treatment of tumors that have a prolonged natural history uh, of not progressing and impacting life expectancy of patients. I think there is a way forward, a couple things I want to talk about. One is to integrate markers. We, I call those PCMs, or prostate cancer markers. And what these are, are, are molecules that can be found in blood, tissue, or body fluids that are the sign of a normal or abnormal process, all right? Obviously, blood is easier than tissue, and urine is also easier than tissue. But some of these markers really need to be done on tissue, and some can be done on urine, and some can be done on blood. And there, this, the excitement is that these markers have added a lot to our understanding of prostate cancer. What we like to do is put these into com compartments or buckets. And the first bucket is where I'm going to spend my time and that's on an initial biopsy. The goal here is not to find prostate cancer, but the goal here is to find a significant prostate cancer. And we're going to talk about a couple of these markers in particular. One is a blood test called 4K score. The other one is a urine test called Select MDX, and I'll mention also 5. We also, and we'll talk about this later in this meeting, men who have a negative biopsy whom to rebiopsy. Again, we have sort of the same players, 4K score, select MDX, and also another test called confirm MDX. Genetic testing is important, and we'll be covering that too during this meeting, um, and the inherited rates of prostate cancer 
the implications of BRCA2 positivity and so forth. And then we also still find, unfortunately, men who have Gleason 6 cancers, low grade, that are candidates for active surveillance. But we're not totally correct all the time, and that's where some of these other markers come in and play a role to help us determine who has an aggressive cancer. And we'll hear also about in this meeting the role of some of these markers in men who have had a local treatment, primarily radical prostatectomy, who appear to be candidates for radiation or may not be candidates for radiation postoperatively, and we have actual markers that help us determine who would benefit and who wouldn't. So th this is sort of, I look at this as a fox hunt, and it's, uh, it's sort of this whom to biopsy initially, rebiopsy and treat. And we're trying to find the fox here with all of the dogs. And so how do we do that? Other than, you know, it's sort of, they sort of at a distance all look the same. But, you know, driving it back to men. Here are four men with prostate cancer. One of these men has a potentially lethal prostate cancer. But how do you differentiate these very low risk from the high risk men? I show this as sort of an a, uh, analogy. Here's a man, here's a bank. He comes in with dark glasses on. What's his risk of a bank being a bank robber? Well, it goes up when he has dark glasses on. If he comes in with a backpack, it goes up a little bit. If he has a walkie talkie, it goes up a little bit. He comes in with a gun, that's a major eraser of the risk of having being a bank robber. And so all of these things are variables. And we put all these in our little think tank and we say, okay, what's the relative risk? And sometimes uh, you have a whole bunch of variables that mean something and sometimes you have ones that are very important. Uh, and the, 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 the importance of this is, is that none of these tests are perfect, okay? It's, it's all, if anything was 100% sensitivity and specificity, I wouldn't believe it. But they all, they all add a little bit, you know, but the guy comes in, he's got a badge that wipes it all out. So the, these things are all important, but nothing's perfect. And every time I give a talk on markers, somebody always says, well, I did this marker on this person, and it said he was low risk and he had metastatic disease. Okay, it happens, you know, they're not perfect. So we, we, we do the best we can, and some of these are up in the high 90%. And it's called precision medicine, or personalized diagnosis. And that's what we're doing now. They've done this in breast cancer, melanoma, and that for many years. We're starting to do that in prostate right now, where we have things that go beyond Gleason score, PSA, and so forth, to give us some relative risk of the person harboring the cancer or having a recurrence or needing a biopsy. All right, we heard about the US Services Preventive Task Force. They gave this a D. That was a number of years ago. Now it's a C. Well, when I, when, when I got into medical school, it wasn't much difference if you had a D or a C, you didn't get in. And so I don't think C is that much of a change. Um, and so what we need to do is rethink this whole thing. The U.S. Services Preventive Task Force, I asked people, who are they? Oh, they're a bunch of bad guys and ladies that are against screening. No. What they are, actually they did us a favor. The U.S. Services Preventive Task Force was implemented by an act of Congress some several decades ago to advise family practice physicians on treatment outcomes uh, and provide guidelines and things like that. What blood pressure do you treat? What, you know, and so forth and so on. What cholesterol and so forth. But Here's a, here's a statement that I think is very strong and is meaningful today. Using PSA alone to guide prostate biopsy decisions for the most part should end. Not unless, you know, PSA is 15 or 20. But we have, most of the PSAs we do, and I'll show you this in a minute, are sort of in that, that gray zone between one and a half, two and a half, to six or seven, okay? And how do we determine when to do a biopsy? It shouldn't be on PSA alone today. We want to find aggressive cancers. We need tools to detect these, to risk stratify, to reduce unnecessary biopsies and overdetection of indolent disease. All right, what percent of PSAs are ordered in the United States are ordered by urologists? Well, when I ask urologists this question, most of them, wrong. Most of the PSAs, and I thank Matt Rosenberg for this work, 
uh, are ordered by family practice internal medicine doctors here, only 6% by urologists and 1.3% by hematologists, oncologists. So if you're going to start and deal with this problem, where do you start? You start with the family practice doctors. Educate them. The problem is we confuse the heck out of them. What we do is we say, family practice doc, we have a PSA cutoff of 1.5, 2.54. We have PSA velocity, PSA density, age-specific PSA, percent-free PSA, complex PSA 5, PCA 3. Select them, the X4K score, and they go, oh, help. They have enough to remember. They need a simple message. And they need to know when to refer these men to urologists. So I, what I did a number of years ago is went to the Henry Ford database, and I knew the answer before I went there, but I just wanted to substantiate it. Is there a PSA cutoff below which you have a low risk of having prostate cancer? And the answer was is that when it was less than 1.5, less than 0.5% of men developed a clinical prostate cancer was diagnosed within the next five years. And most of those were not significant. Whereas if it was 1.5 to 4, not above 4, 1.5 to 4, the risk went up substantially, almost 20-fold if you were African-American and 15-fold if you were Caucasian. And the area under the curve here was pretty good. It was uh, 0.87. All right, we published this in urology it, with a a group of experts from around the country, uh, including Johns Hopkins, Memorial, MD Anderson, NCI, Cleveland Clinic. It was a tough paper to get together, but it did win the best paper of the year last year. And what it said was this cutoff of 1.5 may be the way forward. So th the next question was, oh, how many men out there are going to, and this was the ARS question, are going to have PSAs? of greater than 1.5. Are you going to over flood the market? And we went to bioreference labs, and they gave us this data of men that had PSAs done in their labs, almost 500,000. What we see here is that 73% had a PSA of less than 1.5. So that means you're dealing about with one in four men in this gray zone. And so the way forward is I think that and Matt Rosenberg and I have talked about this a lot, is family practice doctors, when you go, everybody says shared decision making. Okay, it ain't gonna happen in prostate cancer, I'm telling you that right now. If, if it does, I think the person is biased one way or the other, because they're not gonna spend 15 minutes talking about this. They got more important things to talk about. You know, hypertension, obesity, smoking, diabetes, all these other things. Not this, this controversy about prostate cancer. So we need two things. A simple message to them, because most family practice doctors, I think, believe there is some value with early detection of prostate cancer, okay? I see a lot of them that I do PSA testing on, okay? So I think they believe in it. Uh, the, the question is all the controversy, lawsuits, things like that. So what, what they need is when they, when they see you, do they get informed decision to check your blood pressure? Do they get informed decision to check your cholesterol? Do they tell you if I check your cholesterol and I put you on a statin, you might have rhabdomyolysis, renal failure, and die? No. Do they tell you if I put you check your blood pressure, you, you might be on an antihypertensive, fall down, crack your head, and have a subdural and die? They don't tell you. They talk to you when the tests are abnormal. Why isn't, why isn't prostate cancer the same way? If the PSA is abnormal, then talk to the person. And I think that makes sense. And that resonates with a lot of people. That, you know, informed decision doesn't happen all the time. It happens after the test is abnormal, and that's the same thing. So what, what it is, is is that PSA is a surrogate for the risk of prostate cancer. The other thing is when they draw, when they draw a, a uh, blood sugar on you and it's elevated, do they start you on insulin or metformin? No, they do another test. It's called an A1C hemoglobin. You come in and have an abnormal EKG, do they send you to get a bypass right away? No. They do a vessel study. And if you have an elevated PSA, should you do a biopsy? No. You should do the next layer. And we're going to talk about basically two tests, 4K score and select MDX. And that's, here, here is the algorithm. The patient comes in, elevated PSA, referral to a urologist where you have a family practice person like Matt Rosenberg 
then you do the uh, next level test. PSA screening, 20 million PSAs done every year, 5 million are elevated, and we only diagnose 180,000 men. We need to focus on diagnosing less men, but men that have a higher risk of having a Gleason pattern 7 and above. So let's talk about the 4K test. Okay, 4K, OPCO is out there. They've got a lot of good data. It's a test that looks at four calocrines. You know, the magic ingredients probably are HK2 and TAC PSA or HK2 here. Um, Hans Lilia has worked on that, a good friend of mine, for many years. They combine that with uh, DRE and biopsy status and things so, and give you a relative risk. So, so this is sort of the same slide. But these are all the components that exist of PSA. PSA is percent free PSA, complex PSA, bound PSAs, all kind of PSA isoforms. They've picked on HK2 and these other, and a formula that comes up with a relative risk of you having cancer, okay? Not, again, none of these tests are important. So what's, what, what sets you off? Is it 7%, is it 5%, is it 15%? I think that's the art of medicine too, the patient's age and other things that go on when you do it. And then you get a report back like this that tells you your relative risk and where you see. And a lot, what we see with a lot of these tests, they slide back and forth and give you sort of a slide rule. The 4K test also is a good test to predict the probability of distant metastases in 20 years. Uh, and in fact, uh, what happens is what we see here is that if your 4K test is low versus high, there's a big difference in the rate of metastatic disease. Select MDX is a urine test that looks for two genes associated with aggressive prostate cancer. So these tests are both focused on gene uh, on risk factors. 4K uses what we just talked about before, the calocrines and so forth. And this uses urine, and it's basically developed by the guy that developed the um, PCA3 score, Jack Shawkin. And what you have here is pretty good, a 99% negative predictive value for high-grade Gleason 8s and 98% for 7. So this test is, is predicated on a very high negative predictive value, okay? So that's good. If somebody gets a test and it's negative, you have a very low risk of having prostate cancer. And if you look at area under the curve and compare it to the, the prostate calculator and other things, there is a big difference here. And also some of the work done here is the, the select MDX risk profile for no cancer, Gleason 7, there's no overlap, but it's not perfect, again, for some of the Gleason 6s when it's positive. And so we have, we have, again, a test that's very helpful when it's negative. When it's positive, what they do now is they give you the relative risk of having Gleason 6 and 7. But again, this, with all these tests, it's the bank robber thing and identifying the man. And this is a report you get. This is what I like to get, the very low risk. This is the high risk and uh, it gives you the relative risk of having a Gleason 7 or above. And what we have here is a table, and I'll, I'll show you a website where we have all this stuff in a minute, that goes over Phi, 4K, Progenesis, and Select MDX. So Gleason 6, we want to eliminate it in 2017. And this is this website that we have. Uh, www.pcmarkers.com. I encourage you to look at it. All of this information is in there. Downloadable stuff is in there. And um, we'll pass, I, I brought some cards I'll give it. I, I actually, you can, you can print up cards from there. When you, when you see a patient, you order like 4K or select or confirm, you can check, give it to the patient. They can go to the website. And all the reports are really sort of dumbed down to patients. And there's a lot of physician education stuff there.